All right, so last time we ended talking about direct titrations, where the actual reaction that we're interested in studying is happening um, in our solution flask as we're dropping the titrant into that solution. However, sometimes you need to use a back titration or an indirect analysis. This can be really useful if the titrations reaction is too slow to really uh, visualize right away, or if a suitable indicator is not available, or there's no useful direct titration reaction that you can monitor. So in these situations, you may be able to do an indirect analysis. So what does that look like? So here's an example of a reaction that we can use an indirect analysis for. So in this case, we want to detect the concentration of formaldehyde by using its reaction with the triiodide. So while this is a useful reaction because it's reacting directly with the analyte we want to look at, the reaction is actually too slow for a titration, right? So you would end up adding excess and then it would overshoot and you wouldn't be able to get the equivalence point. So what we do in this case is we add a known amount of excess of the triiodide and we can allow that to fully react with the formaldehyde that's there. And then we're going to have some extra triiodide in our solution. So once we know the reaction has gone to completion, we've given it enough time, we can then do a titration reaction that will react with any unreacted triiodide that still remains in our solution flask. So you can do that with thiosulfate. So triiodide and thiosulfate will react together. So in this case, our back titration, this one is going to be the titrant, and our thiosulfate is going to be the titrant. So this will now be in the burette. This is in our solution flask. After we've done this reaction all up here, we have the excess of the triiodide that was added to the reaction flask. So this would be an example of a back titration. All right, so when we're doing this back titration, that triiodide, which is a yellow to brown color, will end up turning colorless once it's converted to the iodide ion. So this is an example then of a back titration because we can calculate the amount of the thiosulfate we put in there. And we also know the total amount of the triiodide that we added to our solution. So if we subtract out the amount that reacted with the thiosulfate, the amount remaining is what must have reacted up here with our formaldehyde. So this is known as a back titration. We can also do what's called a displacement titration as well. All right, so calcium can react with yttrium and form this resulting anion. However, this reaction doesn't have a suitable indicator. So you can do this reaction in excess of magnesium yttrium, and this will release the amount of magnesium that's equivalent to the same amount of calcium. Right, so this is called a displacement titration because the calcium is displacing the magnesium and the magnesium now is going to be the free ion. And so if we have a way that we can titrate the magnesium then, we can figure out how much magnesium ion has been formed um, during this reaction. And um, once we do that titration, then that uh, same stoichiometric relationship of the magnesium to the calcium is going to allow us to calculate the calcium concentration. So this is a displacement titration. All right, so when we're doing our titrations, we can plot what's called a titration curve. And this is going to give us a nice visual picture of the properties of the titration reactions and how they change as we're adding the titrant to the titrant. So this is an acid-base titration. We have our sodium hydroxide down here that we're adding to our solution, and we are watching the pH change of the solution. So you can tell before we reach the end point that the addition of the sodium hydroxide is not having a large effect on the pH of the solution, right? So our titrant in this case is an acidic solution. 
right? And so if we have a solution of acid and we keep adding sodium hydroxide, as long as we haven't reached the equivalency point, that sodium hydroxide is not having a large influence on the pH because there's still excess acid in the solution. And so it's got a very low pH. But you can see when we reach the end point or the neutral point in this case, and all that acid has reacted with the sodium hydroxide, it will quickly jump in the pH up to the neutral point, which in this case is going to be seven. That would represent our equivalency point. So if we can calculate the volume at this position, and we know the concentration of our sodium hydroxide solution used as the titrant, we can then calculate the moles of our HCl and the molarity of our solution of HCl if we know the full volume. All right, you'll note here on this graph as well, if you keep adding titrant after this point, it's going to quickly jump up into the basic region um, and that's because you're still adding sodium hydroxide, but now there's no more acid to react with it. And so it's going to turn that solution basic very quickly and then level out at the maximum pH. You'll notice also on this graph that there is an endpoint pH of 6.8. So um, the indicator that's being used changes color at a pH of 6.8. Right, so you'd be dropping in your base, 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 and then all of a sudden it changes color. You stop here and you know that this is the end point, right? And so if you stop at that end point and calculate that as your equivalency point, the air in there is actually 0.0002%. So it's super close um, to the volume at the equivalency point. And so that's really negligible when we're thinking about that, that change or that difference. We can ignore that safely. However, if we over titrate this, so this could be like getting the light pink color of phenolphthalein right away. But if we keep adding base and get a very dark pink color, and then we say, oh, that's where we should stop. You can see we've overshot now quite a bit with the um, pH. It's now jumped up to a pH of 11.6. And this also results in a much larger air range. So we wouldn't want to be at this air range, 8.28. We want to be under 5 for sure. And this first air range here is a lot better, right? So you want to be really tight with the indicator. So you've got to go slow when you're doing your titrations. Once you start seeing flashes of color occurring in your sample and you're swirling here as you're adding your titrant to the titrant, you want to do really small drops and go slow when you get close to that equivalency point so that you don't overshoot and make a larger error. This gets easier the more that you do. So we'll get some practice in lab this week. So these sigmoidal titration plots are common for any type of titration that you would be doing. So acid-base titrations produce these, but the other types of titration reactions such as the complexation, redox, or precipitation reactions will also form these sigmoidal shaped plots. So with some reactions, there's also other graphic representations of viewing the equivalence points. For example, in many acid-base titrations, these reactions are typically very exothermic, right? They're um, releasing heat as you're mixing the titrant with the titrant reaction. So if you're keeping track of the temperature, once you've reached the equivalency point and there would be no more acid or no more base there, and then you're adding additional base or additional acid to your solution, the temperature change really levels off because you no longer are um, doing the stoichiometric reaction. You have ran out of one of your substrates, right? And so there's no heat to be released after that point. So where that really changes, this can identify and signal the equivalence point for your reaction. And you can come back down here, say, oh, that was at this volume of my titrant. And then you can do your stoichiometric calculation to figure out how much of the titrant was present. So here again is an example of the burette. You've already used these in class and, and know how to read them. 
You'll also have some videos to watch about preparing your burette when you're doing titrations, how you should rinse them so that you get them uh, very clean before you add your own solution, and that you pre-wash them with your solution so that the concentration of the solution in here of your titrant is very accurate, right? So if you wash this with water, you don't want to have water residue still in the burette when you put your titrant in there because that's going to alter the concentration a little bit and cause air in your uh, sampling. So that's a determinant error that we want to avoid. All right, so in the next section, we'll take a deeper look at how we do our calculations to be able to determine the amount of the titrant in our solution.